Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you here. Let's pray together. Fathers, we come before you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together. Pray if you'd open our hearts to your work today and that we could praise and worship you with abandon, Lord. We love you. Give this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll join us Amen. in standing, please. We'll worship together.
Psalm 140 for us. So if you want to follow along, he'll be in Psalm 140. Get your ribbon there. Okay. <clears throat> Psalm 140. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their hearts. They continually gather together for war. They sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purposed to, t to make my steps stumble. The proud have hidden a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set traps for me. I said to the Lord, you are my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. As for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Okay, thank you, Michael. You really didn't want David praying against you because when he prayed, he prayed with everything he had. And, and so some of those psalms, it's, it's kind of interesting to kind of get a sense of his mindset when he was, um, when he was writing those psalms. But uh, anyway, the worship team is going to play one more song now. And uh, while they do so, if you would like to support what God is doing through your tithes and offerings, there's an agape box in the hallway. If you're watching online, you can go to calvarylemongrove.com and there is a give button there. God bless you.
John chapter 5. It is a, a fabulous chapter, uh, one I've been looking forward to. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, well, you're going to see, there's a lot there. Uh, through the course of our study in 1 John, uh, we have seen that the purpose of John's epistle is that we should be a people who would experience God. That's what, that's what 1 John is all about. Chapters 1 and 2, you remember, John wrote of walking in God's light. In chapters 3 and 4, he discussed living in God's love. And here in chapter 5, in the final section of this epistle, John talks about experiencing God's life. Now, I know that uh, Pastor Pat covered the first five verses of 1 John chapter 5 last week. So we're going to just touch on those verses kind of briefly and then concentrate most of our discussion on the last 16 verses of chapter 5. So in these first five verses, John talks about victory for the believer over the world. And the world here, it's, it's the Greek word cosmos. Interesting word. It's the world with all of its organizations, all of its governments, all of its structures, all of its selfishness, all of its greed, its sorrow, its sickness, and its awful sin. John is going to tell us that it's possible for the child of God to have a victory right down here over this world, which to many of us at most times seems much bigger than we are. It's not much bigger than our God, though. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. So you become a child of God through simple faith in Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Everyone who loves the Father will also love the Son. The spirit of Antichrist says, I love God, but the Son is on a different level. Verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now in chapter 4, John told us more than once that God is love. Now, because God is love, the closer I get to the Lord, the more his love will rub off on me, and the more I will love his children. 
those who think they don't need fellowship with the body or call Christians hypocrites, which a lot of people do, they're not truly close to the Father. Because John tells us that he who loves God also loves his kids. And that is an essential characteristic of a true believer. Verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I, I love that verse. His commandments are not burdensome. What does that mean? It means they're not so tough, they're not so hard, they're not so difficult, they're not so unreasonable that we should have an excuse to not follow them. His commandments are not burdensome. Keeping them is our least reasonable service, isn't it? And love for God is going to show itself in obedience. God's commandments to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, they aren't hard to discern. Nor by the power of his spirit are they hard to follow. Verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. How do we overcome the world's seductions, temptations, attractions? Well, John tells us that our victory is in our faith in Jesus Christ. We overcome the world and the things of the world through our faith in him. And how is that faith developed? By knowing him. How can I know him? By studying his revelation of himself, that is, the Bible. It's pretty hard to trust someone you don't know, right? Let's say some guy you had never met comes up to you on the street and asks to borrow $50, and he tells you, I'll meet you here tomorrow to pay you back. You don't know the guy, you've never seen him before, right? Now, if any of you are prone to give it to him, let me know. I would be anxious to meet you. I can always use another 50 bucks. Uh, now, you, you would say, if somebody in that situation, you would say, I don't know you. How can I trust that you're going to be here to pay me back? It's hard to trust someone you don't know. There are so many scams and frauds going on. But when you know somebody well, and they have a great reputation for integrity, honesty, godly character, you wouldn't have any trouble trusting them, right? If you have difficulty in trusting God, it's because you just don't know him. Your problem in trusting Jesus Christ stems from a lack of knowledge. That's why Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's from Matthew chapter 11. Well, why does he want you to learn of him? because that's where your faith is increased. The more you know him, the easier it is to trust him. We overcome everything the world can throw at us by our faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 5. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? It is our faith in Jesus Christ that gives us victory over the world's seductions and temptations. Verse 6. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. So remember that throughout this epistle, John is doing battle with Gnostics, proponents of the Gnostic heresy, who taught that because the material realm is evil, if Christ was indeed who he claimed to be, he couldn't really have had a material body. The Jesus in whom we must believe is the Jesus who came by water and blood. He was a part of a real, material, flesh and blood earth. Verse 7, For there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. This is kind of an interesting verse. It, it kind of reminds me of a discussion that uh, Pastor Tom and I were having uh, not too long ago. This particular verse, verse 7, might be footnoted in your Bible as not being in the original manuscript. And in this way, one of the most powerful statements of the Trinity takes its place with other passages whose 
validity is questioned in many good translations. Among them are John chapter 8, which is the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. But remember, not only do we have copies of the original texts, we also have sermons of church fathers that are older than the oldest texts that we have. And guess what? The messages of the early church preachers refer to John chapter 8, Mark chapter 16, Romans chapter 8, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Whatever texts they had in their hands contained the very passages that newer translations question. If these texts weren't so pivotal, we wouldn't think so much about this controversy. But I see something more than mere coincidence when such powerful passages are attacked, when their validity is questioned, when their authenticity is called into question. 1 John chapter 5, verse 8. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Just as the Father, the Word, and the Spirit bear witness in heaven, the Spirit, the water, and the blood bear witness on earth. First, the Spirit bears witness that Jesus Christ is in us. Paul put it this way, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's from Romans chapter 8. No matter how many people argue with me or accusingly point out my faults, I know that I am a child of God because his Spirit bears witness with my spirit. Second, water bears witness that Jesus Christ is in us. When Satan says, you're not saved, Think back to the day when you were immersed in the waters of baptism. You came out looking like a drowned rat. We all do. <laughs> what would make you do that? The Spirit drew you, and the water is a confirmation, a reminder to you. Third, the blood bears witness that Jesus Christ is in us. We will celebrate communion today, and as we come to the communion table and we drink of the cup, we absorb and embrace, we commemorate, and we celebrate the work of Christ on our behalf. The spirit inside you, the baptism that you went through, and the blood shed for you, they all work together as one proof that you truly are a Christian. Verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. Now, I don't know about you, but many of the people to whom I've talked have recognized a slight credibility gap between themselves and the news media. The politicians, those who are on television today, it seems like they're always out there talking and saying nothing. Exactly. Now, there are many news commentators to whom I will not listen today because I know that they are not objectively reporting facts. They are disseminating propaganda. Everything they say is biased. It's distorted. It's twisted to suit some liberal position. They're willing to misinform you, and they're willing to withhold facts to gain their objective, which is your submission. It doesn't matter who they are or to what party they belong. I have no confidence in politicians, no. We're in a place today where it's difficult to receive the witness of men or women. But the interesting thing is that John Q. Public swallows it hook, line, and sinker. You can tell by the different polls that are taken that a person's influence or popularity is determined by what the news media say about them. The media can build up the biggest frauds in the world. Now, Hollywood, of course, has done this for years. Most people do receive the witness of men. They're taken in by it. If it's said on television or if it's put into print, they'll believe it. There are many people who believe whatever they read or hear, but they will not receive the witness of God. And that, of course, is tragic. 
because God's witness is so much greater. God's news is truly good news. And it's about his son who died for us on the cross. That's his message. God said of Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If we believe the information that mere people give to us, how can we not believe the statements that God made? Verse 10, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. Nobody likes to be called a liar, right? Anybody here like to be called a liar? That's like one of the worst things people can say about you. But if you don't believe God's witness, in effect, you're calling him a liar. It's a pretty bad charge to make against God. The only unforgivable sin, as you know, as we've discussed, is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is refusing to believe God's witness to your heart. It's not believing the Holy Spirit's witness that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Your only hope of eternal life is in Jesus Christ. If you don't believe that, that is unpardonable. God has made no other provision for you for your salvation apart from Jesus Christ. When he bears witness to you of your need for Jesus and surrendering your life to him, and you refuse to believe him, you're calling God a liar. You didn't believe the testimony that God has given of his son. What is the testimony, the record, that God gave of his son? Verse 11, and this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Sorry, Islam. I know you believe that God is not begotten and neither does he beget, but you're wrong. Jesus Christ is God's only begotten son. Sorry, Watchtower Society. I know you don't worship Jesus because you don't believe that he is almighty God. You also don't believe that he rose from the dead, but you're wrong too. He is God and he did rise from the dead. Sorry, Salt Lake City. I know you believe that Jesus was created, that he is Satan's spirit brother, that he was married, and that his sacrifice was not sufficient for our salvation. But you're wrong too. The fact of the matter is this, life is in God's son, period. Eternal life is to have Christ. This is the gospel in a nutshell. There's a simple test you can make Verse 12, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. <clears throat> There's something I, I hope you noticed there. He didn't say he that belongs to the church has life. You can say I'm a Baptist or I'm a Methodist or I'm a Presbyterian or I'm a Nazarene or even I'm a Calvary Chapelite. Your church membership does not mean that you're saved then what does it mean to be saved? He who has the Son has life. The question is, do you have Christ? Is he your Savior? Do you completely trust in him? If you haven't reached that point, you haven't gotten anywhere at all. To be saved means that you trust Christ. It means that you have Christ as your Savior. He who has the Son has life. He's our lifeline. He's our only hope. We're lost without him, but if we have him, we have life. On the other hand, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. God has given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. You can't have eternal life apart from the Son. Eternal life is much more than a quantity or a duration of time. It's a quality of life. Forget about religion. Forget about churchianity. Forget about all the gimmicks that are going on today, such as taking courses or going through rituals. Forget about it. The most important question you'll ever face is, do you have Christ? Is he your savior? That's why John has spent so much time emphasizing that Jesus is the son of God. He is wonderful. He is God manifest in the flesh. He is the only one who can save us. 
He is absolutely unique. There is no one else like him. He is the only begotten Son of God. And he died upon the cross because he alone could pay the penalty for our sins. He rose again, and at this very moment, he's living at God's right hand, interceding for you and for me. He is the living Christ. Do you have him as your Savior today? That's the only question you need to answer. If you have him, you have life. You're saved. That's the record. Now, do you believe God or not? If you don't believe him, you're making him out to be a liar. John has put this right where we can get it. You can't miss this. Right now, the only thing that will keep you from coming to Christ is the sin in your life that you're not willing to give up. That's the only thing in the world that will stop you. That's the decision you make. So John's message was very consistent. In his gospel, chapter 3, he said, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. And then he added one more phrase, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's a pretty ominous phrase right there. I mean, I've had people mad at me before. It's, I, I, I don't like that, but God's the one who can really do something about it. And Hebrews chapter 10 tells us it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And indeed it is. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Some people think that your need to hear the basic gospel message is concluded when you accept Christ, but that's not true. The need to hear the simple gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ does not end when a person embraces the gospel. We benefit by it. We're assured by it. We're helped to continue in it as we hear and embrace it over and over again. John's confidence is impressive. He wants us to know that we have eternal life. We can only know this if our salvation rests in Jesus and not in our own performance. If it depended on me, then on a good day, I'm saved. And on a bad day, I don't really know for sure, do I? But if it depends solely on what Jesus has done for me, then I can know. I can be sure. Verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So if you get kind of bored sometime and you really need some entertainment, uh, you can try asking Siri some questions. Now, if you ask Siri, am I fat, and I tried this, <laughs> If you, if you ask Siri, am I fat? Siri responds, I think you're great just the way you are. Or, I would prefer not to say. Those are the, the two main options. <laughs> now, when you say, I love you, Siri, it responds, I think you're pretty great, too. Or, sometimes, I bet you say that to all your Apple products. <laughs> so, I asked Siri to tell me a joke. It responded, I've got a pen that can write underwater, and it can write other words, too. That was a pretty lame joke. <laughs> so then I asked, why did the chicken cross the road? And Siri answered, because the little chicken-shaped light was green. <laughs> I don't know who writes this stuff. <laughs> Sometimes the answer you get is so ridiculous that you'll find yourself saying, did I just hear what I think I heard? <laughs> and I can totally picture God saying, Something like that, when we ask him for things that are not part of his will. He's good enough, kind enough, loving enough to say, I didn't just hear that, did I? We sometimes ask for the dumbest things. Think back for a minute to that for which you passionately prayed when you were 18 or 24 or maybe even 60 years old. God is so good to you and to me that he says, 
I'm not going to hear your prayers that are outside my will. Not because I'm mean, but because I want the best for you. But if we ask for anything according to his will, God hears us. We have his word on that. We say, Lord, help me to love people. He answers, I hear you. We pray, help me to forgive people that I feel have wronged me. He replies, I hear your prayer. John tells you and me that if we ask anything according to his will, God hears us. And if he hears us, then we have confidence that he will give us that for which we ask. If your prayers are crashing before they make it to heaven, you should determine why. Psalm 66 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I'm living in rebellion and sin, my prayers won't be answered. Why? Because God is mad at me? No. It's a sign that I'm involved in some sin that will wipe me out if it's not dealt with. Thus, God's failure to answer my prayer is not punishment. It's protection. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. God wants husbands and wives to walk in unity and in love. So if a husband isn't loving his wife, his prayers will be hindered as incentive for him to make things right. Therefore, Matthew chapter 5 says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. When you come to the altar, the place of worship and petition, and there the Holy Spirit taps you on the shoulder and he tells you that person is deeply and greatly offended with you. You need to make things right with that person before you continue in prayer. John chapter 15 says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. If we're not in the word, we can't pray in harmony with Jesus' heart, because we won't know what his will is. Consequently, our prayers won't be heard. This is a rhetorical question. Is there a sin that you're harboring? Are there problems in your marriage? Is there a relationship in your life that needs to be repaired? Are you neglecting God's word? These are issues that will hinder our prayers. Verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. So John says, if you see a brother sinning, pray for him that the Lord is, will convict him and that he will choose to do what's right. But if he's sinning unto death, do not pray for him. The sin leading to death is the rejection of Jesus Christ, the blasphemy of the Spirit. See Matthew chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 6, God declared, My spirit will not always strive with man. There comes a point in time when a person says no to the Spirit's prompting so many times that they can't be born again. If a person has done this, we're not to pray for them. How can we know whether someone has reached that point? We can't. Therefore, we're to keep praying. So if you think back in time, you might remember a serial killer named Jeffrey Dahmer. He murdered and dismembered 17 men and boys between the years of 1978 and 1991. And believe me, when I was doing my research for this message, I saw the details of what he had done, and I am sparing you from, it is, it is awful. It is unspeakable what he did. And in 1994, he was killed by another inmate at his correctional institution. But what many people don't realize about Jeffrey Dahmer is that before he died in prison, he had a true born-again experience. He ended up sharing the gospel with every prisoner that he could. 
you might be thinking, wait a minute, this guy kills people? He does unspeakable things with their remains? He goes to prison, he hears the gospel, he gets saved, and now everything is okay? Yes. That's shocking. But as shocking as that might seem, the power of Calvary's cross, the master's matchless mercy, the unfathomable, unfathomable potency of the blood of Jesus Christ makes such a miracle possible. Now that might seem disquieting and troubling at first, but in reality, it offers great hope to us, I think. Because if the Lord can save Jeffrey Dahmer, he can truly save anyone, even you, even me. Verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Now, we do a lot of wrong things, but they're not going to damn your soul eternally. I believe in the grace of God, and I think there's only one sin that can damn your soul, and that is the rejection of God's love in Jesus Christ. That's the sin leading to death. God is so gracious and merciful. There is sin not leading to death. Verse 18 begins, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, because I have a new nature. Whoever born, is born of God does not practice sin, does not work on getting better at sinning. The old nature is dead, so I can't practice sin. Whoever is really born of God, is born again, can't practice sin. We may sin, but you'll find out something very interesting, and I have found this to be true in my own life. Once you're born again, you can't get away with your sin. You may be good at having, you may have been good at, uh, getting away with sin in the past. Before you were born again, you might have cheat, cheated and gotten away with it. However, once you're born again, God won't let you get by with it. He'll nail you every time. That's because he loves you. And he knows that it wouldn't be good for you to get away with it. So God will see that it is exposed. If you're getting by with it, you better look out. It could be that you're not truly born again. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. That's from Hebrews chapter 12. That means that he won't let you get away with it. We know that whoever is born of God does not practice sin. Verse 18 continues, but he who has been born of God keeps or guards himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Who is it that was born of God? Jesus Christ. You should correct the capitalization here. He that is begotten of God, he should be capitalized. The original Greek text makes it clear that the word he refers to Jesus and the word himself is actually him. Thus, Jesus, who is begotten of God, keeps him. Keeps who? You and me. See Jude chapter, or er, verse 24. Now I love that. Jesus keeps me, and the wicked one can't do anything to me. It is not possible for a Christian to be demon-possessed. Why is that? Because we're kept by Jesus. And greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Verse 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. This is truth, but it isn't despair. Things will not be right until Jesus Christ comes back to rule and to reign. Until then, it's pointless to pin our hopes to anything but that fact. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. So John ends this epistle with a word of warning. And at first glance, it kind of seems out of sync with the rest of the book. But it's really most appropriate. You see, considered in context, the idols of which John writes aren't movie stars or sports heroes fancy homes, opulent lifestyles. That's not what he's talking about. 
The idols to which John alludes throughout this epistle are those who embrace and propagate the spirit of Gnosticism. Gnosticism can be seen in anyone who worships their own concept of Christ, anyone who idolizes their own intellectual theology about God. It will always manifest itself in a pulling away from the body of Christ. You can see that the, you know, the end result of such idolatry in the story of a man named Micah that is found in Judges chapter 17 and 18. Micah's mom used her life savings to buy idols for her son. A carved image, which was possibly a silver calf, like the golden calf of Exodus chapter 32, and a molded image, which was possibly a poor replica of the Ark of the Covenant containing a copy of the Ten Commandments. And after building a shrine for his idols, Micah made an ephod. Now, an ephod is an article of clothing worn by priests. After fashioning teraphim, or family gods, he consecrated one of his two sons, one of his sons, I should say, to be his priest. This sounds strange to us. But Micah was emblematic of a problem throughout the nation of Israel, a nation which everyone, in which everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You can find that in Judges chapter 21. And when a Levite passed through his region, Micah jumped at the chance to add a bona fide priest to his designer religion, and he employed the Levite, hired him for money. And at that point, Micah had a religion with four attractive elements. First, practical convenience. Micah's shrine was conveniently located in his backyard. So Micah had no journey to make, no traffic to fight. Second, family involvement. His mom financed the whole operation, and his son was the priest, quote unquote, so Micah could have family time, even as he worshiped. Third, biblical components. With his ephod, miniature ark, copy of the Ten Commandments, and a replica of the idol the first high priest had made, Micah incorporated some biblical components into his backyard religion. He did that as seamlessly as those who think that a recitation of the Lord's Prayer at a family gathering or the display of a nativity scene at Christmas is an alternative to fellowship with the body of Christ. The fourth thing that was convenient for Micah was cultural tolerance. Mixing teraphim with the Ark of the Covenant made Micah inclusive and politically correct. But Micah's custom-made religion collapsed all around him when the men of Dan ripped off his idols and hired away his priest. Not much of a god, is it? But it could be stolen from you. As a result, Micah's do-it-yourself belief system, which had notably included practical convenience, family involvement, biblical components, and cultural tolerance, was, in the end, tragically impotent. And the writer of Hebrews gave us a warning. He wrote, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That's in Hebrews chapter 10. We are to worship as a family corporately. If we don't, when trouble strikes and disaster comes, we'll run to our custom religion, but it will not save us no matter how loudly we cry. Any of us who have been through difficulties and tragedies, and I'm assuming that includes pretty much everybody in this room, we know that blessing and strength come from being part of the body. Submitting to the Lord's principles and precepts and continuing faithfully in his ordinances. The tabernacle containing the, the true Ark of the Covenant, the true Word of God, and the true priesthood stood in Shiloh, only a few miles from Micah's house. While Micah dabbled in deception and idolized imitations, reality was just up the road. And may that never be said of us. May we continue to be those who exchange the subtlety of idolatry for the surety of Shiloh as we renew our commitment to be a people 
whose God is the Lord. Next week, we're going to continue our journey through the Bible with a study on 2 John. And you're going to notice a difference between 1 and 2 John. 1 John is a true epistle, and 2 John is more of a personal correspondence. Uh, but there's a lot of practical application in that book. And we'll go through that next week. So let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this great grace, this faith that you have lavished upon us. Not because we deserve it, we don't. Not because we earned it, we haven't. Not because we're worthy of it, we're not. You lavish your grace and mercy upon us because you love us and you desire to have fellowship with us. And that is the only way that you can do that. And in your infinite mercy and grace, you have restored us to that place of true fellowship with you. And the only way you could do that was through the blood of your son shed on that cross. How wonderful you are. We love you. We celebrate you. We remember you this day. Thank you, Lord, for your favor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now Pastor Tom is going to lead us in communion. Good morning. Have any of you had any incidents with the post office lately? Incidents? Any trouble getting packages delivered? Oh, yeah. Or they come look, looking like a herd of buffalo trampled below them? Okay. Because we have two. And um, I think it's a symptom of the unraveling of our culture. It's just kind of a small thing, but it's happening everywhere. And if you watch the news very much, it's very uh, disheartening and discouraging. And you come away not believing you can trust anything, any institution, any um, organization, any government agency, you, what, you name it, it's hard to trust it anymore. And that's very sad. But we have to be honest, I think, and uh, call it what it is. So Satan's on the move. He's doing lots of things, and he's uh, undermining uh, everything in our lives, or at least he's trying to. And that's why the foundation of Christ in our life is so important. So, because we're unshakable, we're unmovable. But we have to keep focused on the Lord and not get distracted and not get pulled away with other things. And today is Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after Easter, approximately. So um, Greg was sharing a verse uh, in the other room there when we were praying. So I wanted to make that a focus of our uh, communion today. Uh, Acts 1 verse, I want to start with six. So when they had come together, they were asking him, Jesus, Lord, is it, that, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when, you, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So I'm just going to encourage us shortly here, quickly, to focus on the major things in our life. And that's that salvation comes through Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection. And that, that um, salvation is by grace through faith, it's not by works. So we can't do anything to add to what Christ has done for us. And um, he wants us to share that with other people. That's the Great Commission in a nutshell right there. Take this message that he has told us about, revealed to us so that we can be saved, and share it with people around us. It's a very simple concept. And our testimony is more powerful probably than all the verses you want to share with people. Don't worry about sharing Bible verses. Tell them your story. Tell them what you were, tell them how Jesus found you, and tell them what happened after. That's powerful. Okay, sometimes we don't think our 
testimony is very special. You know, it seems routine or humdrum, but it's not. All of us here, our testimony is a miracle. And it's fabulous and it's wonderful. And you don't know that your before testimony is going to sync with them. They'll say, yeah, I thought that. Yeah, that's where I'm at. That's where I, you know, fit in the, in the whole plan of the world. And then you tell them that the light of Christ has come into your life. So, don't be shaken. Don't be fearful. Try not to get frustrated with the world stuff because it's, you know, hard not to get frustrated. But seek the Lord. Know Him more and more each day and share that faith, that Christ salvation with others around you. Jack?
we share communion together every other uh, Sunday or first and third Sunday to commemorate, to remember, to um, have communion together as a body with Christ present with us, to remember what he did for us on the cross. The Lord in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take the wafer. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may drink it.
ocean, loving kindness is a flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Grace and love, like mighty rivers, <clears throat> flowed incessant from above. The Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. May that love, may that depth of commitment, may that passion and that power and that majesty and that mercy and that grace just infuse and overflow your life this week. And may it be so evident in your hearts that the people around you can't help but notice it. And may he pour out his spirit on you. And may he make you his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Time is short. The days are evil. Go out there and tell people about him in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his countenance, his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May God richly bless you.